In this short video tutorial, we're going to have a look at the Rinnies and Weber's test. Now these are a couple of tests involving the use of a tuning fork that can be used to supplement your examination when a patient presents with hearing loss. Now of course there are many different causes for why someone might present with hearing loss. And for the most part, from the history alone, you will probably be able to reach an appropriate diagnosis. However, sometimes you may require some further steps in your examination to try and localise the pathology that may be causing the patient's hearing loss. Broadly speaking, uh, hearing loss can be categorised as either conductive or sensory neural. A conductive hearing loss occurs when there is a problem somewhere within the external ear, uh, namely the external auditory meatus, or a problem within the middle ear. Whereas a sensory neural hearing loss implies that the pathology is within the inner ear, so the cochlea, or somewhere along the vestibular cochlear nerve or the auditory pathway towards the area of the brain in which we perceive sound. So following your initial history and um, examination of the ear, including otoscopy, uh, you may decide that it's appropriate to try and further define the potential uh, cause for someone's hearing loss if it's not been immediately apparent from your initial history and exam. So to do this, you obviously will require a tuning fork. Uh, usually um, 512 hertz uh, is, is what should be used for this test. So let's start with Weber's test. Weber's test involves the placement of a vibrating tuning fork um, on the top of the patient's head um, or in the, on the forehead, so long as it's in the midline. The tuning fork, which is vibrating, will then send the sound through the bone towards the inner ear. So if I just demonstrate this on um, this diagram here, we see that the Vibrating tuning fork is placed onto the top of the skull in the midline, um, pressing firmly, and the vibration uh, will be carried through the bone towards the uh, inner ear. So these little blue squiggles here will denote the, uh, the cochlea. So in a patient with um, hearing that is um, normal um, and their inner ear is working as it should do, the vibration um, or the sound vibration through the bone will reach uh, the cochlea equally on both sides and will therefore be heard um, the same on both sides. As a result, when you ask the patient um, to indicate whether they hear the sound um, equally in both ears or whether they hear it louder towards one side or the other, the patient with normal hearing um, will describe um, hearing it equally in both sides, both ears, and will often describe uh, sensing that sound um, as, as sort of centrally in the middle of their head. Now, while we have um, this sound reaching the cochlea through the bone from this vibrating tuning fork at the top of the head, it's important to remember that we also have general ambient noise from the external environment also reaching the cochlea through the normal route, i.e. through the external and middle ear towards the cochlea. And this external ambient noise, even if you're conducting the examination of a very quiet room, actually acts to mask some of the um, input from the sound that's coming through the bone towards the cochlea. Now, of course, if both ears are normal and there is no impedance to noise from the external environment reaching the cochlea, then the masking from the external environment on both cochlea will be equal on both sides. Where this comes important is that if you had a patient with a conductive hearing loss, then that patient will have a pathology that is impeding this external ambient noise reaching the cochlea on that side. So, for example, if a patient has a large uh, amount of wax that's impacted in one of the um, ear canals, say on the right side, then when you place the tuning fork on top of their head and the vibration, the sound is transmitted to the cochlea on both sides through the bone, the problem here on the right with the wax um, will lose the masking influence of the external noise 
because it's blocked by the wax. Thus, when you ask such a patient which side um, they hear the noise loudest, they will describe it as being loudest on the side of the conductive hearing loss, i.e. the side with the impacted wax, for example. And that's because this cochlea now is only having to pick up the signals carried through the bone from the vibrating tuning fork, and they are not masked by any external ambient noise coming in through the external and then middle ear, because it's not been able to do that on this side. However, on the normal side, for example, on the left-hand side, we also have this sound vibrating through the bone towards the inner ear, but we still have some masking of that sound from the external ambient noise, which on this side has been able to pass through the external and middle ear to reach the inner ear itself. Thus, in a Weber's test, if a patient has a conductive hearing loss, the patient will lateralise the sound so they will hear the sound generated by the tuning fork on top of their head loudest on the side of the pathology and that is because of the loss of this masking of noise coming through the normal route through the ear i.e the external or the middle ear so any condition that affects the external ear such as wax or otitis externa, externa or indeed the middle ear for example an acute otitis media blue ear or otosclerosis um, when you perform a Weber's test on that patient, they will hear the vibrating tuning fork loudest on that side. So what about uh, sensory neural hearing loss? So in sensory neural hearing loss, the problem is not with the um, signal getting from the external and middle ear towards the inner ear. The problem is actually within the inner ear itself. So again, coming back to Weber's test and placement of the tuning fork on top of the head, we will get vibration and conduction of sound through the bone to both cochlea. Now, if we have a sensory neural hearing loss on the right-hand side, then this cochlea is not going to be as receptive to the sounds that are reaching it, whether that be from the external environment or through bone uh, from the vibrating tuning fork. As such, a patient with a sensory neural hearing loss, for example, on this right side, will not hear that bone conduction of sound as well on this side. On this side, however, in the normal working inner ear, the patient will hear it perfectly. As such, in a sensory neural hearing loss, the patient will lateralise the sound during Weber's test towards the normal ear. So, for example, a patient presents to you with a unilateral hearing loss. You take a history and you perform an examination, have a look in the um, external ear canal and you're not quite sure that you can see anything abnormal. And when you perform the Weber's test and you ask the patient whether they lateralise it to one side or the other, uh, they report that they hear it loudest in the left ear. Now at this stage we don't know that uh, whether they heard it loudest in the left ear because they have a, a conductive hearing loss on this side or they heard it loudest on this side because the right ear is the problem. They have a sensory neural hearing loss on the right side. And this is where the use of the Rinne's test can therefore help to further determine whether the problem is indeed on the left or the right side. So in a Rinne's test, uh, again, we use the uh, vibrating tuning fork. And the principle with Rinne's test is that sound that is conducted through air, through the external and middle ear to the inner ear, is heard loudest than if we were to purely transmit that sound straight through bone to the inner ear. And the, and the reason that um, air conduction is better than bone conduction in terms of um, our hearing is that the external ear helps to obviously funnel and focus air vibration and sound onto the tympanic membrane. And then the middle ear, with the presence of the ossicles, helps to amplify that sound onto the um, oval window, into the inner ear. So that the very presence of having an external and a middle ear actually allows us to hear a lot better than if we didn't have an external and a middle ear and required on that vibration um, simply going through bone towards the inner ear. So Rinne's test essentially plays on that. Uh, first of all, we would 
place the vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid process just behind the ear and that is to convey that vibration through the bone straight to the inner ear and therefore bypassing the external and middle ear. We then place the tuning fork as it continues to vibrate in front of the uh, external auditory meatus and therefore allowing the vibration to pass through the normal route which is the external and middle ear to reach the inner ear. And we ask the patient whether it sounds loudest with the tuning fork placed over the mastoid process on the bone or whether it sounds loudest when it's placed just in front of their ear. And a normal um, Rinne's test or positive Rinne's test would be the patient reporting that it sounds a lot louder when it's placed just in front of their ear because that's using air conduction to get the sound to the inner ear. Now where we might lose that um, relationship of air being better than bone is if there is something inside the external or middle ear that is impeding the transmission of vibration through that route towards the inner ear. And in such instances then the air conduction won't be better than bone conduction because the air can't actually get to the inner ear through the normal route but rather going through bone can bypass that problem and go straight to the inner ear or the cochlea. So a Rinne's test if it's normal implies that everything is okay in terms of the external and the middle ear. However if the patient reports that actually bone conduction so sending the signal straight to the cochlea and bypassing the external and the middle ear is actually better than air conduction, then it actually tells you that the problem is somewhere within the external or the middle ear. So in the case of this particular patient who um, we said lateralized their Weber's test to the left ear, if we were to perform the Rinne's test on the left ear and found that air conduction was better than bone, then that would imply actually there isn't a conductive problem on this side the external and the middle ear are working as they should and that the problem therefore must lie on the right hand side, the sensory neural hearing loss on the right. If we were to do a Rinne's test on an ear that did have sensory neural hearing loss, the relationship of air being better than bone would be maintained because the problem lies at the level of the inner ear. So if there is some reduction in what we hear um, reaching the um, cochlea, whether it comes through the normal route through the external and the middle ear or whether it bypasses that and comes through the bone, it will be equally diminished um, but the relationship will still remain the same. So that essentially uh, concludes this video tutorial on the Winners and Weavers test. Um, obviously if you identify that a patient has um, a unilateral hearing loss, hearing loss or indeed bilateral hearing loss um, and uh, it isn't something that you feel is immediately uh, treatable, so for example like an infection, uh, then it's important that the patient is obviously referred on for, for further investigations and likely also audiometry, um, so more formal hearing tests to determine uh, the underlying cause.